Okay, everyone, uh, welcome back. This is where we left off at the end of part two. This is where we pick up with desiring machines and their syntheses. This is the first parts of the first chapter, really, of Anti Oedipus. So, for Deleuze and Guattari, desire has historically and quite consistently been associated with negation and with lack. We've just seen a large, an extended, um, given, I've just given you an extended analysis, I suppose, of that with respect to Lacan. But this idea that desire is always a desire for something I don't have, a desire for something I'm lacking, is a common way of thinking about it. It goes back to Plato, although there are different ways of reading Plato's symposium on this point. But um, it, it, you can read into Plato the, 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 the um, endorsed, you could say, um, version of desire, is that desire is for something you don't have. And Lacan just kind of updates this and changes it into the desire for something you can't, you know, for something impossible, for an impossible object. Um, but it's in Hegel too, of course. Recognition is something I don't have, is something I'm, you know, I'm desiring. Um, so it's seen in terms of acquisition rather than production. Desire is what I lack, therefore it's seen as something I desire is found on the side of acquisition rather than on the side of producing. Fishing is a form of acquisition. Um, I suppose manufacturing, farming would be a form of production. Desire is not seen to be productive, except when it is acknowledged as productive, it's productive of fantasies, fantasies that are seen as compensations for realities that are lacking. Deleuze and Guattari's starting point is that desire has to be seen as productive, and it's not productive just of fantasies, i.e. dreams as wish fulfillments. That's, you know, Freud's, you know, Freud, Freud's original understanding of dreams. It's not just the creation of fantasies that serve as compensations for reality. It produces reality in the sense of producing real social forms. That's their contention. So we have to see these social forms not as a superstructure produced by economic production, but as a result of direct investments of desires. Um, the un and, and the unconscious, they say, has to stop being thought of as a theater, which is the way Freud describes it, and it has to be understood instead as a factory where something is made. So the unconscious is a factory, is the central um, uh, image, I suppose you could say. They don't say metaphors. They say everything they say is not metaphorical, but which, which is to say they really mean it's a factory. The unconscious is really a factory, but it's, that's the portrayal of it. Okay, so desire first is a production. How does that work? Desire is not only productive, it's also machinic. And so desire always takes the form of a desiring machine. Now a machine for Deleuze and Guattari is not simply a mechanism. It's not something that's simply mechanical. Although we can talk about machines that have mechanisms as a useful way of describing some of the things that desiring machines do. A desire is machinic Desire is, basically, Deleuze describes it, Deleuze and Guattari both say, desire is an assemblage of heterogeneous components that function through their strife and, fiction, and friction. And so they produce flows of energy, they work by flows of energy that are cut or diverted or pushed in some other way. Um, so I have, not unlike a Rube Goldberg machine, and that Pee Wee Herman breakfast machine is, is an example of one. They're all, it, Rube Goldberg's machines were all of these totally complex, ridiculous machines to do something simple like wipe your face with a napkin or something. Um, but big, huge mechanical things, what they usually were composed of are these small things that, that, that are little machines in themselves, but then when they intersect with some other machine, they cause it to change in some way and do the next act, action required to make the whole thing thing come out. And that's what that's what these machines are doing. That's what the Pee Wee Herman breakfast machine does. That's what all of these other kinds of um, examples that you find. I think that's one of the more extended ones. But, but you can find them in, in other shows, other movies. Um, the Coyote has some of them in, in Roadrunner cartoons that I've introduced to you. Well, I've introduced the cartoon to you before. Um, 
desire is, again, heterogeneous components that function through strife and friction, right? So, and, and this is the way they need to be analyzed. They need to be analyzed in terms of how they, how they, how they work, I should have said, through strife and fiction, friction. So it's not what function they, they, what role they play in society. It's not what they mean. It's what, it's how they work to do what they do, right? The desiring machine, being an assemblage, is a machinic assemblage of heterogeneous impulses, we could say, um, can be also understood in terms of bricolage, all right? Bricolage is a form of artwork where you just jumble together all sorts of different materials, right? And um, that's uh, just a little bit of a documentary on, on one of the early, um, art, well, an artist whose early work was, was I think it was, that was the first work was named Bricolage. Um, but Deleuze and Guattari are actually referring to Levi Strauss's um, um, use of the term to create, uh, use of the term uh, in relation to the creation of myth, mythic thought. But anyway, Bricolage, you must have done this in school, right? You make a piece of artwork by using... I don't know, um, um, popsicle sticks and glue and buttons and string and paint and right, you th put it all together in some way, right? Jumbled together from kind of everyday things that are at hand, right? Desire as a machine is a machine that is composed literally like a bricolage. And one of the things about bricolage is that in principle, anything can be connected to anything else any piece can kind of go next to, can work with anything else. There's no necessity to the connections, okay? They might overall create an image, um, and that's what a lot of bricolage kinds of paintings, you know, can do. Um, but what desire is going to be is the machine that involves these kind of heterogeneous connections, heterogeneous materials connected together, okay? Desire produces by connecting the heterogeneities. Now production, they go on to say, is the imminent principle of desire, and desiring production is, a, is they refer to as primary production, or as the production of production, which means that it's not the production of things, it's just the production of production, okay? Which means it's a production of connections, without a distinction being made between the production and the product. Hence it's connections without an end goal or purpose or ultimate you know, object being that's being created, that's necessarily being created, that's being sought, I suppose, to be created. It's not for a purpose, okay? Again, it gets back to what I mentioned before. Desire is a proliferation of connections. A desiring machine proliferates connections. And for them, a desiring machine proliferates connections by taking heterogeneities and bringing them together, and those heterogeneities relate to each other through also friction and strife because they're not the same thing, so they're not continuous with each, with each other. Machinic assemblage of heterogeneous impulses, that is desire in the, um, uh, in the unconscious, because the unconscious is composed of drives or impulses, Deleuze Guattari will, will say, and Freud will say, and Lacan will say. All right, although they have different, different views on what that means. Okay? The unconscious is populated by desiring machines that Deleuze say operate at a molecular level. So desiring machines are molecular. Social machines are going to be something called molar, which we'll get into later. Molecular you could think of, and molar, in Foucauldian terms, they're similar to the micro and macro levels of power relations Foucault talks about. So desire is molecular, you could think of as micro, micro relations. Their molecular relations or molecular assemblages of heterogeneous drives that includes energetic flows and partial objects, which is a term taken from child analyst Melanie Klein, who is also a subject of great criticism and attack in anti Oedipus. So, Klein has an idea of part objects um, that the child's initial experience of you know, when a baby is born, it doesn't know what a person is. It doesn't, when it's looking at people, right? It doesn't even know that it is a, a unit, that it, it is a, a single living thing, all right? Um, Lacan makes this point. It's called the mirror stage. It's only at about six months or so that an infant looking at its reflection in a mirror 
um, can recognize that it is that this whole thing that it's looking at is it, and it is meant to be similar. Early infant life, you know, infants can see pieces of people which they can't integrate into an understanding of a whole person. So the breast is a part object, right? Part of a of a greater whole that an infant can't can't comprehend at birth, um, but which makes its way itself felt both in conscious life, but also in in unconscious life. So the, um, the, this idea is that the unconscious is, contains drives, instincts, impulses, part objects or partial objects, and so forth. There are no whole objects in the unconscious. There are no person figures. There's no mommy or daddy or, or me, right? So there's no Oedipus complex, they say, in the unconscious. Those figures, if they do come, if they do enter the unconscious, they come later on, okay? And then, as I say, desiring a machine will work off the friction that the connections of these heterogeneities engender, which is as much as to say that the desiring machines work only when they break down and by continually breaking down, because they always have resistances in the form of frictions that are imminent to them. Okay? It will hopefully become clear, and I'll try and work out an example for you a little later. So now we have desiring machines, which are constituted in this way. Deleuze and Guattari speak of three syntheses that weave together these components and make them work together in some way, make them function through their resistances and strife to do something, to work in some way. These are syntheses in the forms of, which can be seen, made uh, likened to, <laughs> the notion of dispersion in Foucault. If you remember, dispersion for Foucault was not things scattered in space, but things actually mixed together, heterogeneous, maintained their heterogeneity, but they were thoroughly mixed together and became, in a sense, continuous, even though they were heterogeneous. So mayonnaise was a mixture, was a, was a dispersion of um, eggs in, uh, in oil, egg whites in oil, particular. I think, well, yolks as well. Um, egg, eggs and oil. So that's the way these syntheses have to work, or have to be understood as well. Um, their component parts are um, inextricably, intricately bound together and mixed together. So that's what the synthesis is. But there are kind of three, three elements or three aspects to it. The first we've actually talked about quite a bit. That's the connective synthesis. It's the joining of the heterogeneities of the impulses and the flows and the objects together in the manner of the bricolage. Okay? The simplest machine is going to consist of a flow and a break in that flow, where that flow is blocked or cut or redirected or in some way. And, uh, and it could even, even um, be, be redirected into another flow. So the first example that they give is the breast-mouth connection of the infant. That's a machine. It's a machine for producing and milk and directing it in some way. Um, heterogeneous components, because here there are two bodies that are distinct bodies, right, which are working together in some way. And there's this whole coordination that's involved in it. I mean, again, the inf I mean, infants are able to feed at birth. It's one of these interesting things. They can't even really see yet. Um, there is, and I'll discuss this more next week because it's in the faciality lecture, there's a way in which an infant is, when it first finds the breast, it does it through a visual connection that it makes to the mother's face, although it doesn't actually know that that's a mother's face and it doesn't know that there's a breast underneath it, right? Um, but there's a coordination that takes place, or at least there's a study that Deleuze and Guattari cite about it. Um, but that's coming for the next lecture. The first way in which we speak about, the first synthesis, so to speak, is the heterogeneity connected together, all right, to make a machine. Machines function, they function as machines, they work because they have things being connected together. This also entails something, a second synthesis, which they say is the disjunction. It involves what they say is the body without organs that is, quote, produced in the connective synthesis. 
and what we can think of as a body without organs, which I won't talk about too much in this lecture, and I don't think I'm actually, to be honest, going to talk about it in the next lecture. You can find out about it, and I can talk to you about it more if you want to. It's a common enough term in Deleuze and Guattari, is, and everyone who writes about Deleuze and Guattari as well. Um, but you can think of it as the friction point. So you remember in Foucault, resistance is always imminent to power relations because it takes place in the form of frictions within the ways in which those relations connect together. Um, similar here, but they name the, po the friction point, they, they name the body without organs. Um, and it's because heterogeneities being heterogeneous, when you connect them, there's also a way in which they repel each other because they don't belong together. And the way in which the machine produces this friction, which pushes against it, <laughs> against these connections, that amounts, they say, to this uh, kind of anti-production that's produced by a machine, that has to, by, produced by a productive machine, has to be dealt with in some way. The body without organs is going to be the, the, the seat, so to speak, of anti-production. So I've given you this picture of an engine. Okay, How does an engine work? Engines produce tons of heat. Okay, They create explosions. They work on friction. Like your, your car couldn't drive unless the pieces that were interlocking okay, to make your engine work, and then to transfer the energy of, of your engine to your wheels through a set of gears that are interlocking gears, all right? It wouldn't work unless these pieces could be connected, all right? But the connections necessarily also work on friction, right? The gears actually have to mesh together, and they have to push against each other, and they have to always threaten to break, you know, they can break, they can wear out, and they can break, okay, because they produce the friction as well. Now that's why your um, engine, in order to work too, um, in order not to just explode, because the pieces connect together, but they also produce the things that would make the engine just blow up, unless there were two things that were present, oil and water. The oil to lubricate everything, the water to cool everything down. These two systems can never mix. There is nothing worse than the water, the coolant, mixing with the oil in or and around your car engine. Because that means that a gasket, i.e. your head gasket, is gone. And the result is not entirely unlike itself, mayonnaise. So if your car stops working, or if the heating stops working, if no matter how, um, how long you've run the engine as you're driving, you've noticed that you know, you have the fan on, but it's not heating up, even though the heat is on. You probably have a problem with your head gasket being gone, and that's the beginning of the end of your car engine, usually, if it's serious, which it easily can be, if the water and the oil mix. I'm just warning you from experience. The engine works off the friction. The, the engine works off the friction as much as it works off the connection, okay? Which is also why it works by breaking down and why you have all these additional systems that are set up to keep it going for a little while, longer than it would if, if you didn't have lubricants and you didn't have a coolant system. By the way, it turns into mayonnaise not because of the water mixing with the oil, but because of the coolant mixing with the, with the oil. But it produces mayonnaise. It, it's white. It's the same color as mayonnaise. I've, I don't, I've never, didn't try tasting it for obvious reasons. Um, but let's go on. So those are the first two syntheses. Connective, disjunctive. The last one is conjunctive. A synthesis that they, that Deleuze and Guattari say, gives rise to a form of the subject. So you had in Lacan the subject that becomes a subject because it enters language and says I. Here you have a different kind of subject, which is related to the, the workings of the unconscious. It's not a subject of lack. It's not a subject actually of resolved identity either. Deleuze and Guattari refer to it as a nomadic or wandering subject. In a way, it's wandering alongside the processes of these, uh, of these um, molecular desiring machines. Okay? How to explain this? The conjunction of desiring machines, connectivity, and its body without organs producing its repulsion eventually resolves itself in some kind of action or some kind of becoming. And the subject emerges alongside of it as its resolution or its consummation. So I've given you some examples here 
um, the car engine is one, okay? The car engine and the parts of the car generally are not moving in a horizontal straight line. Your engine's pistons are moving up and down and they are creating a, a rotating motion and most of the parts of your car are not going in the straight line that the car is driving but together through their friction and through their different operations they move the car in that straight horizontal line okay and it's the whole car that gets moved all right when you are running or you're doing anything else that's athletic chances are there are all of these micro movements that are taking place where your pieces of your body are working with but also against each other so that's a animation of Usain Bolt running. I don't know if people, if you know this, when you run or you just walk, when your right leg goes forward, your left shoulder goes forward. It's called contra body movement. You learn about this if you dance too, right? It's really important because otherwise you fall over. Um, your body works kind of through this counter movement and your backbone, that's why your backbone needs to be flexible. Needs, your joints need to be able to to you know turn against each other your your vertebrae I should say all right in order to compensate you know in order to transfer this energy all right um, but it's the same thing if you are in, in terms of these kind of contradictory movements that are at work if you're going to throw a ball if you're going to shoot a basketball if you're going to jump if you're going to punch right you punch from the floor right that's how you get your power but you have to be able to to transfer a lot of force from your feet and your legs through your arms and there's a lot of kind of movements within your body etc to make a single continuous motion make an, in the end result what looks like a what looks like a simple motion okay um, the result is the simple motion is the consummation of the conjunction of these different component parts moving with and against you, forces and movements acting with and against each other. Third one is the coffee cup, okay? Um, and this is where the impulse, the example of, of the unconscious as a set of impulses comes in, okay? You typing, Jim Carrey, Bruce Almighty again, is, is typing, takes the coffee cup, okay? The way in which Deleuze and Guattari and others will describe the unconscious is within you you have all sorts of impulses and drives you have to write an essay in this case he has to answer he has to read through and answer all these prayers but you have to write an essay and you are not simply a whole thinking um, I think therefore I am subject you are according to Deleuze, Guattari, Freud, Lacan, others a whole set of competing impulses on most of which you're unconscious of you don't really have a drive to write your essay um, you have drives and impulses to chew on your nails or to fiddle with you know something nearby or to get laid or to drink a cup of coffee or just to scratch yourself or just to just fidget or to watch TV or to do all sorts of other things too okay if you, with all of these different impulses in you, are going to write your essay, there has to be some way in which these different impulses get integrated into a single action, into a single activity, right? Um, and that could involve, um, that could involve, in some sense, when some of your impulses are weak, just being able to suppress them. I'm not going to get up and call my partner and fool around because I've got to get my essay done. Or, um, or you, or you have to co-opt some of them. So I'm, I, I want to chew on something, but I have to type. So I'm going to chew on a pencil or on a pen, right? Blah, 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 blah. Okay, um, and whatever. Now in the end, the essay gets written, and you say, "I wrote the essay." Okay, there was a way in which your drives were coordinating enough to make this action happen, right? Or you were driven to pick up your coffee cup and drink, or tea in this case, and drink it. Nietzsche says this too. Your drives drive you 
to do to an action, then con- your consciousness retroactively says, I was thirsty. I picked up the coffee cup and drank it from it. Right? A thought came to me. Afterwards I said, I thought it. Right? So that's the I. That's where the I emerges. That's where the subject emerges. It emerges kind of retroactively to um, adjacent to, subjacent to, alongside of these activities of this desiring machine that managed to move you, like any machine, ultimately was able to move, if it functioned, if it worked, um, if it didn't break down, that moved the whole mechanism, the whole, the whole thing, the whole organism in this case, in a certain determinate direction. Machines do end up moving or creating determinate outcomes. The determinate outcomes, Deleuze and Guattari say, get accompanied by this subject. I did this. The car moved that way. The, the guy ran. Okay? The guy is a collection of all sorts of things, right? Lots of parts. Parts of guys, right? Parts is parts. All right. So there you have it. These are the three syntheses. Connective, disjunctive, conjunctive. Things connect together. They create friction. Something gets resolved. There's a determinant outcome to the way in which these connections and frictions inter- interact. Okay? That's a desiring machine. Psychoanalysis, Deleuze and Guattari say, consistently overlays onto this dynamic of dispersed impulses and part objects, etc., within the unconscious, a set of fixed Oedipal meanings and categories, the triangle of mommy, daddy, and me. So there's a schizophrenic drive, which they say is what desire is. The, it's a drive to proliferate, to connect and proliferate connections. It gets reinterpreted as incest desire, for example, and then it gets made into something shameful. Melanie Klein, that's the key figure and all of that, the, the inventor of this idea of part objects. Klein is a um, child psychoanalyst who's working with kids, including her own son, who she psychoanalyzes. There's something about the ethics of some of these people, too. I'll give you a couple of stories related to this. The first one, Deleuze and Guattari give themselves, okay? Well, I should say, a preface to this. So, you know, kids aren't as articulate as adults, so psychoanalyzing them is not quite the same as sitting them on a couch and then having them tell you stuff. Um, So the way in which she did it is she played games with kids, and that was her way of, for her, what she says, getting into their unconscious desires, figuring out what's going on inside them by the games they played, which she totally sets up. So the example that they give is she has this kid playing with these trains, and she said, this is daddy train. This is you train. There's a smaller train, which I forget the kid's name. This is Robert, Roger train. It's not going to be Robert. It's going to be Roger train. Okay? And, um, and then there's a station. So kid's playing with the trains that she's named. And he takes a smaller train and puts it into the station. And he says, that's Roger wanting to go to mommy. Roger gets really upset. The kid gets really upset and runs out crying because kids cry when you overinterpret what they're doing. But she insists that he had an edible desire which manifested itself in the game that we were, she was playing. Because as Deleuze and Guattari point out, she overlaid onto the activity of just making connections. And that's what kids do. Watch kids play, right? With train tracks or other things. They just take things. They just stick them together. That, when Deleuze and Guattari describe desire as just proliferating connections. You can see that in the way kids play games. This gets overlaid by this idea that they're they're secretly expressing a desire for incest. Another one which is even more crucial, which which is even more illustrative. As I say, Klein and psychoanalyzed her own child, her own son. Her very first publication, her very first paper that she gave was um, meant to be an analysis of a child, of a child's unconscious, um, who turns out to be her son, but of course she doesn't name him, thankfully, uh, doesn't say it's her son. This was a boy, I think maybe five years old, who wasn't very much interested in sex or, or, where, or parent, like what, what, um, how babies were made. I think he has, also has a little baby, baby sibling as well. 
Um, but it hadn't really shown much interest in any of that. It turns out, as, as she writes, um, the boy did once ask, what are fathers for? And the answer that he got was, fathers provide love and support in the family. And he just said, okay, so that's what dad's doing. And of course, he knows he's a boy, so he knows dad's a boy, too. So I guess maybe he thinks that that's going to be his role later on. He asked what his role was. Anyway, she says that he was never interested in, in, in where babies came from or what you know, the relationship was. Um, um, although she does mention that he had this question, and he asked it, and he was given an answer, and he just kind of shrugged his shoulders and went on. She gave this paper and was criticized for not adequately trying to penetrate into the, the child's unconscious. She didn't, she didn't provide a deep, analy deep enough analysis. So she goes and writes an addendum to the paper. And she goes into, the, as she describes in the addendum, she goes back to the boy, her son again, um, to try and, and kind of penetrate into his, his unconscious and his desires. And she tries to prom prompt him again on, um, um, on, on sex and on children, on babies. So she asks him, Where do ba what are babies made of? And he says they're made of milk. Now they drink milk, so that's logical, right? Um, babies are made of what they eat. Babies eat milk. Babies are made of milk. She says, no. They are made of a white substance that comes from their fathers. Now again, the boy had asked before, what are fathers for? They provide love and support for the family. And he never thought much more about that because he got an answer to his question. Now he learns that fathers provide a white substance all right, to help create babies, to help make babies. And um, he's like, does that mean I can do it? Yeah, when you're older, you'll be able to provide this white substance. Can I do it with my mommy? No, you can't. And the kid starts crying. And Klein says that this child expressed his, um, um, his edible desire for his mother. And she set him up, right? She totally manipulated him and set him up to discover the very thing that she you know, wanted to find. She discovered, she, she creates the very thing she wanted to find. All right? That's the psychoanalytic reinterpretation of the Oedipus. You know, they Oedipalize the unconscious. This is what Deleuze and Guattari say. They take everything that should simply be seen as proliferation of connections and everything that sort of follows from that, and they turn it into, you secretly wanted your mother. You secretly wanted your father. Okay? You... You, ha you had incestuous desires. All right? So let's move on. Let's take a break now. We seem, this seems to be a good, good time to take a break. Um, social production, social machines. So we're doing roughly 30 minutes per, per session. This might be five or six sessions as a result. All right, I will see you for part four.